props for uh, your semester long project. Um, I really liked some of the names here. Let's get physiological. Uh, Molecuties was really cute. Hormonal imbalances, I really liked as well. So super cute uh, uh, names here. Okay, so I still had about 16 people that didn't, I didn't have a uh, worksheet for. If uh, you need to uh, give me a new sheet, that would be great. I'm sure you already know what your groups are. I'm going to give you about five to ten minutes to kind of talk about your group project again. Uh, start organizing when you all are going to meet, what you're going to do. Um, and uh, let me know if, I, if you can kind of see on the back of the worksheet too. You'll notice that I made sure that everybody's projects were kind of spread out among all of the sections. Uh, if your name is not on here, if your group is not on here, uh, let me know and make sure that you don't choose either cardiovascular or endocrinology. Those are already full, pretty much. Um, let me show you where you can find where you are. If you actually go to people here on our website, if you go to people on the left hand side and then go to project groups, you can find um, basically your group and all the people in your group, right? You can just click on the name uh, of your group and then you can see who all is your table mates. These are the unassigned students. So if you're not assigned to a group, please come up and let me know. I do have some extras here that you can fill out again and um, we can go from there. So go ahead and work with your groups for about five, 10 minutes, make a game plan, and if you have any questions, come on out. Uh. Hi. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm just putting these paper clips on here so I can identify it, so when I put it in the table, I can. I just don't think that we ever gave Oh, okay, students, no so. worries, thank you so much. Oh, the originals. Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. <laughs> So I remember um, one of our group members was like to have the virtual with John to Shana. Okay. So I was using like Robin. Okay. So I will try to find it. I know that. I'll go ahead and try to find it. Yeah, thank you. So we had a question on do we have to go like do 
like an overview on what geophysiology is, or can we no. like go on into like some like you have explain an, something about the microbiome? Or something right. Like that? Um, you have an educational video, right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I would say find a good story, whatever that is. You don't have to do an overview of GI physiology. Microbiome is perfect. Okay. Um, just make sure who your audience is. You're not talking to other professors. You're going to be talking to basically the lay person or students in the intro physiology class. So make it simple, explain terms. You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Hi, um, so I was gone on the data muscle worksheet, the problem uh, solved, yes. and I handed it in to you. Okay, and um, I just haven't seen it. those are the ones that I haven't gotten. Okay, so perfect. Are, I was just, yeah, yeah, so no worries about that. So we had a question. How are we supposed to know exactly what disease we got? Because on the sheet here, it just says. Yeah, um, I would say I gave everyone their top choice. So go ahead and use what you were planning on doing, your top choice, your top disease, as long as it is within your top. Okay, so like we got uh, endocrinology, so I yep. think we're doing diet. Yeah, yeah. There wasn't many people that did have Questions, everyone. Um, everyone got either their top first or second choice. Okay, nobody. I didn't have to go into the third, fourth, or fifth choices. Uh, if you chose a pathophysiological state, just go with your top choice. I'll give you a few more minutes, everyone. So I, what I would do right now is concentrate on when you'll meet and how you'll contact each other in the future.
Right. Okay. Yeah. Explaining it on camera. So uh, if you are diving into some kind of pathophysiological state, what I'd like you to do is explain the normal, uh, the um, normal mechanism and then compare that to how things go wrong. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Question. Yes. The what? Oh, the length of the video? Yeah. So that's a great question. I just want to make sure that everybody knows this is a very short video, three to five minutes. It doesn't sound like a long time or a lot of information, but what that means is you have to be concise. You have to do a lot of uh, homework ahead of time to try to make sure that it is in a very concise yeah, uh, video. Yes. Yeah, so um, on the group project worksheet, I'll show you where that is. Uh, the bibliography is important at the very end as well. You'll also have to include a quiz, maybe three questions, just to make sure that once the stu students actually go through your poster or video, they can, they can uh, see the questions and test their knowledge. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Right. So the question was, um, is there more details on specifically the pathophysiological state? I'm going to leave that up to you. I want you to have creative freedom on what you're going to choose, but you are comparing a normal state versus a pathophysiological state. Okay. So I'm going to leave that up to you, but try to, well, do stick to the, the main topic though. So if you picked endocrinology, then I need you to stay within that that main topic. <coughs> yeah, you, I have them here. Oh, you don't, okay, sure, sure. If you want to actually come up and find your group project sheet, uh, you can definitely do that. Um, I'll, let's talk after class because if they're not headed. So you have to kind of dig into each one of these worksheets. But I did bring those back if you want to take a look at that. Okay. Actually, Magna, what I'll do on the back sheet here is if you flip this front sheet, then they'll be able to see their, their group right there. Yeah, thank you. All right, so you can pick that up after class. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, here's where we left off. We were talking about comparative physiology as it pertains to the circulatory system. Remember that fish actually have only two chambers. And the blood within the heart is all deoxygenated. Amphibians actually have three chambered hearts. Let me show you what that looks like here. Here's what it looks like. Two atria and one ventricle. There's a lot of mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood within that one uh, ventricle. Remember that they do uh, receive a lot of oxygen from their skin as well. So you can actually see this is a, an amphibian heart. We went through a lot of the details last time, but remember this has two atria and one ventricle. Here's where we're gonna start. I wanna talk about uh, the heart here. This is a mammalian heart. This is human and animal physiology, so this pertains to basically all mammals. We have four chambers. Uh, the other thing is crocodiles are 
interesting. They actually have evolved a four chamber heart like this, which is interesting. They're very, uh, they're thought to be much more closely related to birds now than they are to alligators, which is really interesting. Again, they also have four chambered hearts. So just so you know, I do want you to know the four different chambers, the four valves within the heart, and some of the major tubes, which I'll talk about in just a minute. So if I give you something that looks like this, I would want you to be able to label it, OK? All right, so let's start with the inferior and superior vena cava. These are the tubes that basically return blood to the heart. You can see blue is deoxygenated. Remember, deoxygenated blood is only um, depleted of about 25% of oxygen. So it's not completely devoid of oxygen, only depleted by 25%. So deoxygenated blood from uh, your head region actually comes in through the superior vena cava. Blood coming from your lower legs and feet are coming from the inferior vena cava. So <coughs> blood is returned to the heart into the right atrium. And then this is the right atrium here. The blood, when the two atria contract at the same time, blood is propelled from the right atrium into the right ventricle. Now it actually moves through this particular valve called the tricuspid valve. It's called the tricuspid because it has three leaflets. It's also known as the right AV valve, right atrioventricular valve. So the tricuspid valve is the right AV valve. So I'll go to the document camera here. Just write that down. Zoom in a little bit here. All right, so the tricuspid valve is equal to the right AV valve. And AV means atrioventricular <coughs> valve. So this is the valve between the right atrium and the right ventricle. All right, so I'm going to go back to the document camera here. I'm sorry, the slide. All right, so here we are in the right ventricle. Now, when both the ventricles contract at the exact same time, actually it starts kind of here in the apex of the heart and sweeps up so that it propels the blood out of the heart. It's going to go through this pulmonary semilunar valve. Okay, so this is called the pulmonary semilunar valve. It's called semilunar because it kind of looks like a crescent moon. Semilunar valve. All right, so now go back to the slide here. All right, so now you can see that this is deoxygenated blood, but these are called the pulmonary arteries. All right, so that's a little confusing, probably because you think of arteries as having oxygenated blood. But this is one of the only arteries in your body that has deoxygenated <coughs> blood. And an artery is a uh, tube that actually transports blood to something like the lungs. So it's transporting blood, deoxygenated blood, from the heart to the lungs where it gets oxygenated. We'll talk more about that when we get to the respiratory system. All right. So then it comes, actually, it goes through the lungs. It's oxygenated. And then blood actually is transported from the lungs 
into the left atrium via the pulmonary veins. Pulmonary veins. These are some of the only veins, these are the only veins that have oxygenated blood. All right, so then the blood enters into the left atrium. Remember atria, both the atria are really reservoirs. All right, then the atria contract and they propel blood into the left ventricle. That's right here, left ventricle. And that actually goes across the left AV valve or the bicuspid valve. So this one is a little more detailed. The bicuspid valve, and that's because there's only two leaflets, is equal to the left AV or the left atrioventricular valve. And that's actually the same as the mitral valve. Mitral valve. So if anyone has a murmur, if they know that they have a murmur, most of the time it's due to some kind of defect of the mitral valve. That's the bicuspid or the left AV or the mitral. You can actually use those terms synonymously. All right, so with the mitral valve, if there's a defect, again, this is a murmur, what you have is a bit of regurgitation that goes from the left ventricle back up into the left atrium. So what uh, doctors are listening for when you go to the clinics is instead of a nice lub-dub, lub-dub, it's a lub-sh-dub. It's kind of like a, they can hear the regurgitation, regurgitation. lub-sh-dub, lub-sh-dub. All right, so back to our slide here. Now when, now we have the blood here, we're actually in the left ventricle. When the ventricles contract at the same time with an upward sweeping motion, it actually goes through the aortic semilunar valve. Okay, this is the last valve that I want you to know. <coughs> aortic semilunar valve. Okay, and then back to our slide here. You can see this is oxygenated blood and this tube right here is the aorta. And then the aorta actually transports blood to all, this is the, into the systemic circulation. So this is known as a double circulatory system. You have a pulmonary circulation, that's the blood that's going to the lungs and back to the heart. And you have a systemic circulation. So the aorta actually propels all of the blood into the entire system, the systemic circulation. Pretty good. Four valves, four chambers, some of the tubes, the vena cava, aorta, pulmonary arteries, and pulmonary veins. All right, so what I would like you to be able to do is make sure that you know the anatomy of the heart and which way the blood is flowing. All right. Now, here's a nice acronym just to help you decide which way blood is flo flowing. You can remember two push me around. Some people say to push babies around. To push me around is T is the tricuspid. Push is the pulmonary semilunar. Me or babies is the mitral or bicuspid valve. And around is the aortic semilunar. That actually helps you decide the flow of blood in the heart to push me around, or to push babies around. That was something I remembered as a student that helped me with blood flow through the heart. All right, so, yeah, to push me around. Yeah, can you like tell me like which? Yep, 
So two is tricuspid. Push is the pulmonary semilunar. Me or babies is the mitral or bicuspid. It's the same valve. And around is the aortic semilunar. semilunar. Okay. okay, yeah, sure. All right, so on to the heart. Let's kind of, if you take a look at this particular figure, you can actually see what we're doing is we're going to zero in into this box and take a look at the walls of the heart. So here it is blown up, that box. I do want you to know the different layers. All right, so you may or may not know this, but the heart is actually surrounded by a sac called a pericardium, okay? The pericardium. The pericardium is actually divided into two different membranes. The outer membrane is called the parietal pericardium. It faces the outside of the heart. The inner portion of the pericardium is actually called the visceral pericardium. Anytime you see visceral, it is the layer closest to the organ, visceral pericardium. And in between these two membranes is fluid. This is the pericardial fluid. Now, this helps to protect the heart. It helps to buffer any kind of movement and jostling. Some of the issues that arise, though, is if you um, get infected with some kind of bacterial or viral infection, Coxsackie virus is actually well known to cause the pericardial fluid to increase. So you can imagine fluid actually more and more and more fluid actually um, being transported into the pericardium. And that can really disrupt beating action. So it can be actually very deadly, some of these viral or bacterial infections that increase pericardial fluid. Okay, but normally this sac is, help, is, is to help protect the heart. Now, let me just talk about the visceral pericardium for a minute. This is continuous with what's called the epicardium. They're pretty much the same thing. They are the same thing. Epicardium is the same as the visceral pericardium. And this is where all the coronary arteries and the nerves are that influence cardiac pacing. So the coronary arteries and nerves are housed within the epicardium or visceral pericardium. Then you see the myocardium. This is cardiac muscle. These are the cardiac muscle fibers. Remember, a muscle fiber is a muscle cell. So myo is meaning muscle. Cardium is referring to cardiac the heart, myocardium. This is where all the cardiac muscle is. These are where the contractile units, the actin and myosin, this is what's causing the actual contraction of the heart. So it's the middle layer of heart muscle. All right, and then finally the endocardium. The endocardium is the innermost layer of connective tissue covered by epithelial cells. So there is some active transport that helps to modify the fluid within the heart, the blood. Endocardium. Innermost layer of connective tissue covered by epithelial cells. All right, so. You have four different parts. If you need some text associated with what I just talked about, you can go ahead and read it as well. All right? All right, we are not gonna concentrate too much on the circulatory system right now. Uh, this will be the last kind of uh, topic that we'll cover before exam two. Just know that, again, there are three major parts that are responsible for a circulation, a circulatory system. You have to have a pump, 
you have to have a set of tubes, and you have to have fluid. And in this case, this actually shows that the red color is indica in indicative of uh, fully oxygenated blood. So we're talking about those hemoglobin molecules that have four different oxygen binding sites. And in this case, when it's 100% oxygenated, all of those binding sites have an oxygen molecule attached. The blue color represents the partially oxygenated blood. Really, uh, deoxygenated blood is only depleted of about 25%. So still, with deoxygenated blood, 75% of those oxygen binding sites still have oxygen bound. Okay, all right, <clears throat> so here is just a, um, these are the tubes in series with each other. Like I said, we'll go through this again when we get to <laughs> circulation. You have to have a pump, you have to have a set of tubes, and you have to have fluid. Now, let me just give you a, a set of terms here just to talk about the fluid briefly. Again, this is all part of the intro to circulation circulatory systems. Interstitial blood is essentially the extracellular fluid that's bathing all of the tissues in your body. Interstitial fluid. This is extracellular fluid. And it is maintained, tightly maintained, to make sure that your cells remain within a somewhat homeostatic environment, right? It's controlled to make sure that there's some kind of homeostatic range environment that these cells are bathed in. So extracellular fluid is regulated by pH, temperature, different electrolytes. All right, the blood within the circulatory system, ours is a closed circulatory system, right? The blood that actually circulates has some major proteins associated with it, albumin, red blood cells, they're called erythrocytes, and white blood cells. Those are your immune cells. I'll talk more about that in just a second. So this is the fluid that circulates within our closed circulatory system. Lymph is a little different. We have a secondary system in vertebrates called the lymphatic system. So the lymph is basically fluid that circulates in that secondary system of vertebrates called the lymphatic system. A lot of immune cells are circulated with the lymph system. And what we'll find out when we get to vasculature is the lymph is actually responsible for returning some of the fluid from the interstitial space, the interstitial fluid, back to the circulatory system. So I'll explain that again. You'll see this again when we get to vasculature. Right now, just know what lymph is. And then hemolymph is the fluid that circulates with an open circulatory system. We talked about this on Wednesday. So if we jump back to this particular slide, when we were talking about <coughs> differences between open and closed circulatory systems, I gave you an example of arthropods that have a classic open circulatory system. The fluid circulating in this open circulatory system is called hemolymph. So we already discussed that on Wednesday. Okay, so let's keep going forward here. And this uh, couple of last slides here, I do want to talk about this blood and all of its components. If you actually took whole blood and you put it into an apparatus called a centrifuge, a centrifuge spins a tube of blood at higher speed, which then separates the blood into um, weight, all right? The heavier molecules end up at the bottom here, and the lighter ones end up at the top. All right, so the blood can be separated into these different components about 55% of whole blood is plasma. And plasma includes water, ions, proteins, nutrients, hormones, and wastes. So if you donate plasma, what you're doing is you're donating your whole blood and they're taking the plasma part. They centrifuge it and then they're gonna just 
isolate the plasma. <coughs> the bottom or heavier portion of whole blood is the red blood cells, erythrocytes. It makes up about 45% of whole blood. It's also called hematocrit, right? <coughs> The hematocrit is also known as a test. It's a rapid assessment of blood composition, and that is the percentage of the blood volume that's composed of red blood cells. So erythrocytes or hematocrit actually is about 45% of whole blood. The rest is this tiny white blood. It's basically a white layer. You can see it once you centrifuge whole blood. It's known as the Buffy coat. And this is where all the white blood cells and platelets are, leukocytes and platelets. And you can isolate all of those white blood cells, again, by centrifuging whole blood. All right, so this is a nice image actually showing you some of the red blood cells and white blood cells that can be looked at under a microscope. There's a lot more red blood cells than there are white blood cells. Students in the lab this week actually got a chance to look at blood, do some blood typing. They got to find out what their blood type was if they didn't know before. And they got to look at some slides that had red blood cells and white blood cells. A lot of high schools actually don't allow blood typing because you might find out you're adopted, all right? But I guess in college, we don't really worry about that. <laughs> uh, so everyone got to, the, the most, uh, most people were either O or A, and the more rare blood types are B or AB. Those are the antigens that are on your red blood cells. All right, finally, let's just talk briefly about um, white blood cells here. All right, let me find my... All right, so um, the ones that I want you to know are essentially the neutrophils, monocytes, lymphocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. So one way to remember this I, some of these acronyms are helpful. Sometimes, you know, you don't have to, to go by them, but never leave monkeys extra bananas. Never leave monkeys extra bananas. All right, so those are the neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and bananas. Neutrophils, whenever you get some kind of burn or wound, like you cut yourself, like maybe even just a paper cut, the neutrophils are your first responders. They're the ones that are on the scene right away. They actually help to make the uh, blood vessels more permeable, which a lot of times moves fluid from in the circulatory system into the interstitial fluid, causing swelling, right? Swelling or edema. So we'll talk about those forces when we get to the vasculature as well. <coughs> Monocytes replenish macrophages and dendritic cells. So they can, uh, monocytes can uh, be transformed. They can differentiate into macrophages. Macrophages actually go along and eat foreign bodies, right? Uh, the next one is uh, eosinophils. Eosinophils actually play a role in combating parasites. And with uh, basophils, they basically play a role in allergies and asthma. Okay, allergies and asthma. All right, so there's a hypothesis out there that um, because we live in the Western wor world, and we don't get parasitic infections all that much. Uh, it's thought that maybe the eosinophils don't have much to do, right? They don't have much to do, so maybe that's why we have an increase in allergies and asthma, because a lot of times eosinophils have infiltrated the lungs. And again, it may be because we don't get exposed to parasites all that much. It's like they're overactive. 
So those are the eosinophils. It helps you remember that they're usually used to combat parasitic infections, but a lot of times they are implicated in allergies and asthma. Now, I don't think the uh, answer to that is to give people like tapeworms. That's not a good idea. But a lot of people have proposed things like that when it comes to eosinophils. All right, that's crazy though. That's crazy talk. All right, so what are lymphocytes? Lymphocytes actually differentiate into um, the large granular lymphocytes. They will differentiate into natural killer cells. They are called natural killer cells, NKC. These natural killer cells, they actually have something in them called perforin. They're like bullets. So when they come upon some kind of foreign bacteria, they will shoot perforin and poke holes in bacteria to help combat that kind of infection. Those are the natural killer cells. Small lymphocytes are your B cells and T cells. B cells are your humoral response. Those are your antibody. Those are your antibody producing cells, B cells. And T cells are basically the cell mediated part of your immune response. And then lastly, basophils. Basophils are least abundant cells. And like eosinophils, they play a role in parasitic infections and allergies. Now the eosinophils and the basophils, you can actually see there's lots of little dots in here. They release histamine. Eosinophils and basophils, they release histamine to try to combat any kind of infection. All right, so don't worry if you didn't get all that written down. Um, remember, I have actually recorded this, so if you just wanna scroll to that part of the slide, you can hear it again when you get home this weekend. Try to get that up today. All right, so let's continue on. I want to start with, I want to start with I think, a great uh, section because it pulls in a lot of concepts that you already know about. Let's go ahead and go to the next. This is lecture 21. Yeah, question. Will this video be posted on um, Maybe I'll put them in both. Yeah, uh, because it's kind of half intro and half electrophysiology. I already have one under the intro, so I may just go ahead and, and put it into the electrophysiology section. Yeah. All right, so um, let's first talk about the electrical component. I've mentioned this before, but I want to make sure that everyone understands let me go ahead and just draw this on the document camera as well. I can't draw, so I'm gonna draw a heart. <laughs> that looks like a valentine, okay? Um, what we're talking about is, right, we have our two atria and two ventricles. They're made up of those myocytes, those contractile cells. That's what's responsible for muscle contraction and propelling of blood through either the pulmonary circulation or the systemic circulation. Today we're going to start by talking about this little patch of cells in the right atrium. This is called the SA node. SA node. And this is what's responsible for giving the heart its myogenicity. Remember, this is, um, these muscles are myogenic. These depolarize the fastest, and this is a spontaneous depolarization. These cells don't contract, they just depolarize. These are your pacemaker cells. Pacemaker cells. And SA actually means sinoatrial. Sinoatrial node. Okay. Now, if someone has something wrong with the SA node, they will have a disorder called sick sinus syndrome. And that's where their pacemaker has gone wrong. 
Medtronic is well known for developing those pacemakers. They're uh, a device that actually is implanted into someone's body. Pacemaker, they don't have to be placed right here in the right atrium. They can be placed anywhere in the atria. Uh, but essentially what that does is it takes over as the pacemaker and keeps the heart beating. All right, so back to our slide. A small fraction of cardiac muscle are called our autorhythmic cells. They depolarize all spontaneously on their own. And they're the ones that determine the heart rate. The larger group of cells that make up your heart, 99% of them are contractile cells. They're, they're the ones that contract. And their activity determines stroke volume. So now that you know how to figure out stroke volume, we'll talk more about how to calculate heart rate next week. But stroke volume times heart rate is cardiac output. Okay, so remember that. That's part of your essential cardiovascular calculations. Cardiac output is equal to heart rate times stroke volume. I actually have a friend who works at Medtronic, and she swears in her interview. She just blurted out, oh, cardiac output equals stroke volume times heart rate, and she swears she got the job because of it. <laughs> so good walking around knowledge, everyone, just so you know. The heart is a pump that moves blood around and its activity can be expressed as cardiac output in reference to the amount of blood that's volume per unit time. We've already talked about mean arterial pressure. In case you didn't get to write some of what we talked about on Wednesday down, it's all in these slides right here. Mean arterial pressure is the sum of the diastolic pressure plus one third times the difference between the systolic and diastolic pressures. Now remember it's one third value at rest, but when you're exercising it bumps up to one half. So this is also saying, I just want to make sure that everyone realizes this as well, the sympathetic and parasympathetic autonomic nervous system, that's your fight or flight, or the parasympathetic is resting and digesting, it's actually controlling heart rate and stroke volume, and therefore it's controlling mean arterial pressure. So your heart can beat all on its own without any input from neurons, hormones, anything like that. But do know that the parasympathetic and sympathetic can regulate heart rate. It can change your heart rate. As you already know, when you get scared, your heart really races. All right, so let's talk briefly here. I only have a few minutes, but let's talk about the electrical current that sweeps through the heart first. Remember, with any muscle contraction, we have excitation first and then contraction. Remember, there's a little bit of lag time between the two. Excitation is first and then contraction of the heart. So. The signal starts here in the SA node first. It depolarizes the fastest. This is what is basically responsible for cardiac pacing, setting your heart rate. And then once these cells depolarize, they go from a resting membrane potential of about minus 70 to minus 90. They depolarize, getting more positive inside the cell. Remember, because of the gap junctions, the depolarization wave goes from cell to cell to cell, and it sweeps through the atria, allowing basically enough time for the atria to completely contract before it sweeps through the ventricles. So remember, the atria contract together and then the ventricles. So the electrical current goes from the SA node sweeps through both atria, then arrives at a little fiber, these fibers called atrioventricular node, atrioventricular node, or AV node. Now, these cells don't have main, many gap junctions, and so the signal slows down in the AV node, allowing enough time for both atria to contract until the electrical, the depolarization wave, 
sweeps through the bundle of hiss, down the septum by the left, and here's the left and right bundle branches, until the electrical signal ends up at the apex of the heart. This is the bottom of your heart. Now you can be super nerdy and say, I love you from the apex of my heart instead of the bottom of my heart. Now you know that term. Okay, I cracked crack myself up. All right, and then up the, uh, these are called the Purkinje fibers. And then it sweeps through the ventricles. Okay, so this isn't the last. It goes through the Purkinje fibers and then the ventricles. All right, so here's what it looks like. Let me skip to this, right? Electrical current goes from the SA node, sweeps through the atria, ends up at the AV node, slows down, goes down the left and right bundle branches, up the Purkinje fibers, and then through the ventricles. Repolarization follows the same path. So the cells are going to depolarize first and then repolarize. All right, we'll leave it there. Have a wonderful weekend. I will see you on Monday. Did you say it'll polarize first and then depolarize or the other way around? Yeah, so it's going to, it's going to be at negative voltages at rest. Okay. And then it's going to depolarize first and then repolarize. And we'll talk about the action potentials on Monday. Okay. Um, but essentially, if you had an electrode, and you impale one cell. This is what you're measuring, depolarization and then repolarization. So each cell, as it sweeps through the heart, is going to depolarize, repolarize, depolarize, repolarize. And, this, and does that have to do with the sound as well? Like, do you think that Yes, okay, so okay. we're just talking right now about the electrical current, but when the muscle contracts after the electrical current, it causes those valves to open and shut. And what yeah. you're hearing is the valves the shutting. Valve, yeah. Yes. The yeah. Yeah. And I the valves are going to open and shut only yeah. because of the contraction and the pressure change. And so this, ha this is, does not colorate with the depolarization and then... No. So okay. what you should think about is with every muscle contraction, the electrical current happens first, those action okay. potentials, and then the muscle contracts, just like with skeletal muscle. Okay, that makes sense. And then the contraction occurs, the pressures change, the valves open and close, and that's what you're hearing. Okay. Yeah. And then one more question. Yeah. So, uh, I know that there's like the T cells. Yes. Uh, they do. They, do they like copy? Like, you know, when you first get sick of, of something that's new to your body, and then there's those copy cells. I don't know what are they called. Do you remember? Yeah, I know some of the T cells have what's called CD. They have different antigens that are expressed. Is that what you mean? I think so. Uh, also, they can proliferate, and that's yeah. maybe what you're talking about with copy cells. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I would just know you don't have to go into more detail okay. on that. Yeah. Just know that that's more considered like a cell mediated response, and mm -hmm. again, it's just to help combat infection. In this class, we're not going to go into too much depth on that. The B okay. cells are the antibody-producing cells, the, the humoral response. Okay. Yeah, but both of them are derived from these lymphocytes. Lymphocytes. Yes, okay. yeah. All right, okay. Good question, but if you oh, take thanks. immunology, you go into way more depth on that. <laughs> uh, I just, yeah, I just yeah, it's a great question. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually fascinated by it myself. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Hi. So I had a question about heart murmur. Yes. I love that you mentioned that because yeah. I'm dog sitting oh, and my, my friend gosh. just got him from the Humane Society and she took him to the vet for the first time yesterday and he has a heart murmur. Oh no. So I was like curious, like yeah. what kind of things can you expect to notice from that? You know, he might have, if he has some major issues with his heart, right. you might just notice that he's more lazy or tired. He loves to run. Oh, That's well, what I was wondering. Yeah. I okay. he, does, okay. he does breathe a lot. Okay. I don't really know. Fast. But yeah. he also is getting over kennel cough. Okay. So like, he has a lot going on. Yeah. <laughs> but he I, loves you know, to run. He's nah. insane. Actually, people live with murmurs all the time. That's what I time. thought. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. You're, you are getting some regurgitation. And you, you can understand this now. Yeah. You might have just a little bit lower of an ejection fraction. Mm -hmm. You can imagine when you actually, those muscles contract. Yeah. Less efficient. Yeah, yeah. less efficient. Okay. A little bit. So instead of propelling 
you know, 55% yeah. of the blood into the aorta, yeah. you get a little bit more into the left atrium. So yeah, it's a little okay. bit of regurgitation, but it shouldn't affect him too much. Like oh. nothing that he does would progressively make it worse. Okay, right? I don't think so. No, unless he gets, there are certain infections, a strep, oh, a systemic okay. strep yeah. infection or Coxsackie virus, but I think the dog, in yeah, dogs, it's, so yeah, cute. that's awesome. I was just curious. I'm so, I was like, whoa, we were literally just talking about Yeah, right now. <laughs> that's right. And it'll actually keep connecting more and more, yeah. which is really fun. Yeah. But yeah, I'm thank glad you're you. making those connections. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I have a question you. about the group projects. Um, yeah. So, I, I remember I joined the class like yes. two weeks late. Yes. So. Are you not in a group then? Well, oh no, you are in a group. I, I saw you in a group. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I'm. I am in a yes, group. Yes, you are. So you are. I think I think that maybe like one of the group members dropped the class. Okay. Yeah, and then the other two weren't here today. So there's only three of us. And how many yeah. people are supposed to be working? Three on? to five. You're three good. Three to five. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I have other groups that are just three students. Okay. So yeah, yeah. I just want to make sure that like three right. people yeah. is fine. I do remember putting you in a group. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. And so, um, do you remember your group name? Um, because it's what this you, one. Yeah. It's the respiratory one. Okay, yeah. yeah. So if you actually um, go to that people tab and mm -hmm. you click on it, mm -hmm. you'll be able to go to your, okay. and you'll be able to see your other group okay. members. Yeah. All right, cool. Oh, yeah. All right, thank Have you. Have a good weekend. Yeah, yeah you too.